Our final reading comes from the prophet Isaiah chapter 40, verses 25 through 31. Isaiah chapter 40, verses 25 through 31. In this holy scripture, listen for God's word to you. To whom then will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings out their host and numbers them, calling them all by name, because he is great in strength, mighty in power, not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youths will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Gracious God, may your Holy Spirit remind us of the value of a place to call home this morning. And may we realize that we are surrounded by family in this place as we offer this prayer to you in Jesus' name. Amen. I recently listened to a long-form interview with actor Tom Hanks. And he was reflecting on a story that happened, some of you are going to find this hard to believe, 30 years ago when he was on a boat with actor Gary Sinise and they were filming Forrest Gump. Can you believe that movie's that old? And Hanks was speaking about a scene in the movie that not a lot of people talked about, but that he thought may be one of the most powerful. Gary Sinise plays the character Lieutenant Dan. And Lieutenant Dan was greatly injured in the Vietnam War, lost both of his legs. His life was only saved because Forrest Gump carried him out of the jungle. And as their commanding officer in the war, Lieutenant Dan was a man who had it all put together. He was stern. He had authority. Apparently no weakness whatsoever. But coming back home with no legs and seeing little support for any veteran, Lieutenant Dan lost his hope, and it was replaced by anger. And along came Forrest Gump back into his life. And Forrest invited him, Lieutenant Dan, to join him on his fishing boat, a shrimping boat for Bubba Gump Shrimp. And things were not going too well in the shrimping business, and one night a terrible storm came through. And Lieutenant Dan, with no legs, managed to get all the way up to the crow's nest. And as the wind was beating against him and the waves came against the boat, almost turning it over, Lieutenant Dan was shouting at God fighting with God, screaming every accusation in the book against God for God disappearing, not showing up in his life. He got it all out. Well, the storm, if you remember the movie, turns out to have wrecked every other shrimping boat except there. So suddenly business becomes good. And in our next scene, we see a different Lieutenant Dan who hoist himself over the side of the ship intentionally just to jump into the ocean there in the Gulf of Mexico and and swim around. And Forrest remarks after being taken aback and shocked by Lieutenant Dan shouting at God that Lieutenant Dan 
seem to have made his peace with God after the shouting match, after fighting with God. This passage from Isaiah is so fitting for the chapters in life where when we're honest and we have suffered and things have not gone the way that we thought they would, even though we think we did things right for the most part, we're looking at God saying, why did you disappear? Why have you abandoned me? I don't see you in my story anywhere. But the best thing about those accusations toward the divine is that we're still talking to God. And any time we're still talking to God, the soil of our lives is being enriched for God to show up in new and surprising ways. The people of Judah had just about given up hope in the chapter previous to the one that we read from. They'd been conquered by Babylon They'd been taken off into exile. They had no home. The temple where they worshipped had been burned to the ground. And during this time in exile with all of the hopelessness abounding, the prophet Isaiah speaking for the Lord finally offers them hope. Finally gives them a reason to cling to the God that they had abandoned to come back to him. After decades of despair and anger by these people who had been displaced, the prophet is inviting them and telling them to heed the invitation to come back to God because he is waiting. The passage reminds those who are hearing it to remember that while we may question God and have our fights with God, to remember that God is sovereign. This passage emphasizes God as the creator who numbers and names all the host of the heaven. And somehow we think he's lost his way, he's forgotten us, he no longer has a plan. Well, for the people of Judah, this great passage of hope is addressing them when finally they have perhaps hit bottom. And sometimes that's what it takes for all of us to find grace. You see, what the the sin and the darkness of this world in which we all participate, what it does to our souls that we don't realize because it can happen so gradually, is it creates a gaping wound. And we try to buy band-aids that we can put over a gaping wound thinking maybe this will patch up my life. Maybe this can help give me some purpose, some temporal joy for a moment. That's not the way God ever seems to work. God finds people when they've hit bottom. God finds people when they're in the valley of the shadow. God doesn't come with band-aids. God comes as the great physician. Now we all have to be honest about the band-aids that we try to use. Something to alleviate the pain that we're feeling. Something that will distract us. Or someone else to blame for all of our problems. And all of these patches that we all try from time to time they end up fruitless. And we finally have to have our meeting with God. That's why I reference that story in Genesis 32 so often. If you have not visited that story in a while, I encourage you to do so with Jacob wrestling with God at the Jabbok River. You may think, well, wrestling, fighting with God, that's not something we should do. Oh, yes, it is. God desires engagement and genuine engagement. Do not forget that it is in that story that Jacob's name is changed to Israel, a name which means the one who struggles with God. That's what this pilgrimage, that's what this life is about. To praise God and thank God in the midst of times 
where we feel we have little to be grateful for, but also like Jacob and like Job to wrestle, to question, to be engaged with God. And God finds us when we're humble and when we're broken. When we finally give up on trying to patch a life together in our own way and give everything to God. I chuckled at a famous tennis star, John McEnroe, this week. Uh, He was giving an interview on on NPR, and part of this was the backdrop. If you hadn't heard, two of the all-time greatest tennis players have just retired. On the women's side, Serena Williams. On the men's side, my personal favorite of all time, Roger Federer. And McEnroe, in thinking about his own tennis career, addressed his infamous temper. Are any of you remember John McEnroe? He liked four-letter words. And John McEnroe was known for that temper, and he spoke one time. It wasn't at a major event, but in a tournament he was playing. The person four years his senior that he most admired, who was known for his very calm temperament, Bjorn Borg. And in the match going back and forth, McEnroe, they were tied one set each, and because it wasn't a major, this was only going to be a three-set three match. Whoever won this third and final set was going to be the winner. And McEnroe remembers he was cussing, he was losing his cool, and finally Bjorn Borg looked over the net and motioned him over. And McEnroe was mortified. He said, it's my hero. It's the man I look at. He's about to call me over and he's going to scold me. He's going to tell me I'm making a fool of myself. I really have gone too far this time. And when he got up to the net, remember, in the middle of a competitive set, Bjorg put his hand on McEnroe's shoulder and said, this is good. Enjoy it. Sometimes maybe you need to put your hand on my shoulder and say that, and sometimes I know I need to put my hand on your shoulders and say that. For all of its ugliness, for all of its bumps, for all of its wrong turns, this is life and it is good. It can be painful. It'll take you to rock bottom, and once you climb out, it'll put you back there again, but God is still there. And so on a homecoming Sunday, when the nation of Judah was looking here at this future possibility of going back home, and it would happen for them, they would get to go back home, and they would rebuild their temple, and things would fall apart again later, but God remains in the story as God remains in our story. Psychologist Randall Maurer was working with folks in their late teens all the way through their 20s and asking them, what is the place that has been most like home in your life? And there's some that had mom and dad together and it was home, or even if the parents had split up, they still had a home with mom or a home with dad. And some even, you know, had been handed off to grandparents and a home with the grandparents. But what struck Dr. Maurer the most were those who had unusual homes to name that we all need to remember were homes nonetheless. There was Taryn. Taryn who said there is no place that she ever knew to be home like her third grade home room with her teacher Mrs. Renfro because her parents were going through a divorce and it scared her. But Mrs. Renfro knew that was going on in her life and spent all the extra time that was needed to make a home for Taryn. She remembers that two decades later. That was her home, Ms. Renfro's classroom. Eddie remembers that he wasn't very good with money and it was his own, pardon my French, damn fault. And one day he came home to his apartment and the eviction notice was there. Three days later, he came back, the locks had been changed. Eddie did have a job, 
He worked at a gas station convenience store and while he was so down on his luck and now about to be homeless with nowhere else to go, he remembers Mr. and Mrs. Merkett who had an attic apartment above their garage and not only let him move in there during that difficult time, but Mrs. Merkett would shout out the kitchen window for him to come in for dinner every evening. And he stayed there six or seven months before putting the pieces back together and finding his own place. But he'll always remember that attic above the garage as a place that was home for a while. Melissa remembers when her husband left her and not knowing what to do or where to go, she moved back in with her parents and finally started doing something her husband had wished she had done years ago and going to meetings, AA meetings at a Lutheran church. And Melissa remembers going to those meetings at first, not wanting any part of them, but somehow four or five months later, the people in that Lutheran church fellowship hall had become a family. Their story had become her story, and her story had become their story. And so even a church fellowship hall can become a home Home can be all kinds of places, and all kinds of places are filled with different faces. Look at all your lovely faces today. Beloved places, beloved faces. We have so many homes. Minokin is a special home for so many. A place where we profess God's unconditional love and abundant grace and when we as men and women fail to live up to that, we ask for forgiveness and we try again. I want to teach you all something about the power of suggestion this morning. Emphasis on power. How many of you have noticed the new bench outside? Every time you look at that bench, after a homecoming, after a funeral, after a wedding, during a vacation Bible school, after a Thanksgiving Eve or Christmas Eve service, take notice of who's sitting there. Say a prayer for them as you think about what may be going on in their lives on that particular day. Now here's the power of suggestion. No matter how stubborn you may be, that's now in your brain. And when you see that bench, you will take note of who's sitting there. You don't have to pray, but that's being really stubborn. Let that bench be a place where people and all of us find sanctuary and safety and home here. And let it remind us all that we are not pilgrims alone on this journey, but we are fellow travelers for all the mountaintops, all the valleys, and everything in between. Look at this beloved place, and look at these beloved faces. This is your home. This is your family. Amen.